Morning. Good morning. How's it going? Well, I'm glad to be with you. My name is Cameron, one of the pastors here. It's good to be with you as we are continuing through our uh, journey through the, the book of Galatians. I hope that you've had a chance to pick up one of our Galatians journals. It's, uh, it's a way that we uh, interact with the message during the week, that we'll hear a sermon on the weekend, and then for five days we'll journal and have devotionals uh, during the week. And we're thinking, well, you, you guys are kind of far into this thing. Uh, may not be worth picking it up. I would just remind you that uh, Pastor Ricky put us on a 17-week journey through the book of Galatians. So there's actually, after this week, there's still 10 weeks remaining. You still should pick one up. Please uh, take, check one of these out. They're, they're available out at the Welcome Center. If you're online, we definitely want you guys to have one of these too. Uh, pick one of those up. Hit uh, one of the hosts up online, and, uh, and they'll, uh, they'll let you know how we can ship one of those out to you. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. So glad that you're out there. We know you're joining us from all over the place, and we're just glad uh, that you've joined us at Southwest. If you're ever in the valley and you want to come by, we'd love for you to come by and say hello in person. We'd love to meet you face to face. Well, if you have a Bible, if you have a Bible, meet me in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at uh, nine verses this morning, verses 1 to 9. Paul has been writing to these churches in this region of Galatia. It's a region, not really a single city, multiple cities that are kind of in a region. And he's writing to them about the fact that they are saved by faith, not by works. He's writing because there's been this mess created in the churches in Galatia, because they had some teachers coming in teaching a different gospel than the one that Paul had taught them. So he's writing to try and correct some of this teaching that they were saying that it's really a Jesus plus message. Ricky has been telling us this for the past few weeks. It's a a Jesus plus or faith plus these actions are how I become a Christian or how I uh, am sanctified and grow in my faith. Paul wants him to know that They begin by faith, and they continue in faith. So let's read Galatians 3, 1 to 9 together. If you have your Bible, if not, the verses will be coming up on the screen behind me. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and he was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. The word of God. Paul has clearly spoken to the Galatians so far in this letter about justification by faith. Faith alone. The truth is so important that Paul has said it multiple times. He's told them multiple times, we've already heard justification by faith, not by works. You may be sitting here thinking, even now, I think we've already heard this sermon. It's like those times like in, uh, in, during the pandemic when we're all watching Netflix, and like, I think we already watched this one. I think, this is, I think we've already seen this sermon. I think we need to see something else. And I just want to tell you, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder for next week, but guess what next week's sermon's about? Justification by faith, not by works. We see this famous passage, the righteous shall live by faith. It's so important of a truth that Paul wants to uh, make sure it's clear. So it's worth repeating. It's worth us hearing multiple times. You see, one day, at the end of days, we will stand before the judge. We'll stand before the judge and we'll want to hear the ultimate verdict of our life. We'll stand before the judge and we want to hear the ultimate verdict. We'll want to hear justified, righteous. That's what we desire to hear, but that only happens, that only happens through faith in Jesus. Placing my faith in Jesus Christ, believing that Jesus died on the cross in my place and Jesus rose from the dead to defeat death. 
The crucifixion is so critical to the redemptive story told in Scripture. Paul reminds the Galatians in the beginning of our passage that he taught them Christ crucified. And he wants them to remember the foundations of their faith. He wants them to remember when it all started for them. He says to them, and he says to us, he said, do you remember? Do you remember hearing the word preached? And then you heard the gospel, and then the Holy Spirit convicted your hearts, and and faith happened. He said, do you remember? Paul writes in Romans, that's how it happens. The word is preached, and people hear, and people believe. That's how Christians become Christians. Paul reminds them that in the gospel that they were taught Christ crucified. The Galatians were given this complete picture of the gospel with clarity and accuracy. And the assumption was that at least some of them in the text, the the assumption is that some of them heard and some of them believed. Many of them heard and many of them believed what was preached. Paul gave the complete gospel. He gave the same gospel with clarity that he gave to the church at Ephesus. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. Same clear gospel he gave to the Romans. Look at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him... We have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The gospel from Paul was clear and complete. But these Galatians had had some people come to town and they had heard a different gospel. They'd heard some different preaching. They heard some preaching that was, yes, it was faith, but it was faith plus something else. It was a gospel plus something else. For them, The Jews were adding things like circumcision and and they had to go eat at a kosher deli and a bunch of other things that they were adding to their faith. And Paul wants them to know that it's faith alone and that works of the law could not save them. Works of the law, following the rules, following obeying commandments was not gonna save them. In the Old Testament, there were 613 laws. 613 do's and don'ts. And if there's one thing I know, I don't know everything, but there's one thing I know about us. Over the course of human history, we have proven with 100% clarity that we can't do that. We can't do that. We can't obey all the rules. That's why Jesus is necessary, and Scripture agrees with us. Romans chapter 3, verses 20 to 22. Listen to this. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified. In his sight, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, manifested in Christ, apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe faith alone saves. Now Paul uses a strong word to make a point. He calls them foolish He's telling them what they're believing, faith plus, adding something to their faith, working for their faith, doing something that they think to perform or to work or to effort. It's so crazy that the only thing he can think of is that they're bewitched. Literally, someone has put a spell on them. Witchcraft is the only thing that Paul can, they can only describe what they're believing. And in verse two, he asks a rhetorical question. He says, let me ask you one question. It's actually one question with four follow-up questions. You ever seen one of those press conferences where they say, I have one question, I have two follow-up questions. So it's kind of like that. So Paul asked a total of five questions, but this one question he asked first, he asked this. He said, did you receive, when, it be, when you began, when you started in your faith, when you began in your faith, did you receive the Spirit by faith or by works? When it all began for you, was it because of something you did? Or was it something you believed? The Galatians would agree, and and we would agree, that Christians become Christians by faith. Christians become Christians by faith. Paul even assumes their answer is going to be yes, that they would agree with this. And in verse 3, he gets to the issue. He gets to the problem. 
He says, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Being perfected in our faith means becoming like Jesus. Being perfected is being conformed in the image of Jesus. This happens over my lifetime as a believer. Over your lifetime as a believer, we slowly become more and more like Jesus and less and less like our original selves. We will never be 100% complete until we're face to face with Jesus one day. That's when perfection happens. But the ultimate primary will of God for our life is that we would become like Jesus. That's his will for our life. Look at Romans 8, 28. For those he foreknew, he also predestined, listen, to be conformed in the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. What did he predestine us into? That we would be conformed into the image of Jesus. We would be like Jesus. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, our holiness. That's the will of God, becoming like Jesus. A lot of us get stuck wondering what God's will for our life is, and this is his primary will for us, that we would become like Jesus. The primary will of God for every believer is that we would grow into the image of his son, that we would become holy, that we would become like Jesus. And this is where the wrong teaching comes in that Paul was challenging. Here's the myth. Here's the myth that Paul was challenging. Christians begin by faith, but then are perfected by our own efforts. The false teachers that were coming into the churches in Galatia were saying, yes, faith, but then you have to be perfected by your own efforts. Like faith was some kind of a Christian starter kit, and then the rest of it is like Christian training wheels, and the rest of it is like we have to just grind it out. That the rest of it is on us. But the truth is, that's not right. Think about this for a second. Who is best capable of shaping my heart, shaping my soul, shaping my character into the image of Jesus? Who is best capable of shaping your heart and your soul and your character in the, images, in the image of Jesus' heart, soul, and character? Am I, am I the best person qualified to do that? Are you, are you the best person qualified to change your character? Or is it possible that Jesus is more qualified, that God is more qualified to do that. So really this morning, this morning the first question we have to wrestle with is who do I believe? Do I believe God or do I believe me? Do I believe God or do I believe me? Do you believe God or is it possible that you actually believe in you? Pastor Tim Keller, smart guy. He talks about psychologically everyone who is trying to save themselves, everyone who's trying to grow on their own with their own performance will experience a curse of some, some sort. He says this, he says, at the very least, at the very least, attempting to be saved by works will lead you to profound anxiety and insecurity because you can never be sure you're living up to your standards sufficiently. The best thing that trying to save ourselves will do is cause anxiety and insecurity. When we become followers of Jesus, at the moment we believe, God sends the Holy Spirit to take up residence in our heart. The third person of the Trinity takes up residence in my heart. God lives inside you. Then he starts a remodel on your heart. He starts this rebuilding and this changing from the inside and all we do is operate on faith. All we do is operate on faith that he is gonna continue this work. It's the kind of faith that Paul describes to the church at Philippi. Look at what he writes to the Philippians in Philippians chapter one, verse six. He says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit will conform us into the image of Jesus. He will all we have to do is cooperate. All we have to do is lean in. We have to dwell. We have to abide. We have to remain in Christ. We just obey in faith. We just obey in faith. We obey in faith knowing that God will continue the work to conform me into the image of Jesus. My external work then, the work that I do outside of myself, the external work I do then becomes a response to the internal change that's happening inside of me. It's an inside-out change. 
The work I do is no longer compulsive. It's no longer that I feel an obligation. It becomes a joy to work and to serve and obey because it's a heart change. So let's get a handle on this for a second. I'm not saved by works. I'm not saved by works. I'm saved by faith. I'm not sanctified. I do not grow in the image of Christ by works. I grow by faith. So then you're sitting there and you're saying that this book talks a lot about doing stuff. It seems like we're supposed to do stuff. So you're saying we're still supposed to do stuff, right? And I say, yes, you are. We are supposed to do stuff. The question, though, is what is my motive for doing things? What's my motive? What changes is my heart motive, which means I'm no longer trying to be a good boy or a good girl so that God will bless me. We're not good boys and good girls so that God will approve of us. He already does. He already approves of you. He already loves you. He loves you the maximum amount possible. So now, what we're talking about is my motive is about this heart change that's happening inside of me. So earning my righteousness, that can't be my motive. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he's a a great German uh, theologian. He's a Lutheran pastor. He was an author. He really reached the pinnacle of his prominence in World War II. He was actually a pastor who had escaped Nazi Germany, but then he was convicted to go back to do something to oppose Hitler. So he went back to Germany. He joined the German resistance, and he was ultimately martyred for his faith in Germany. But Bonhoeffer wrote a wonderful book called The Cost of Discipleship. He wrote in this book about this paradox between faith and obedience, paradox and doing stuff. And he says this, Bonhoeffer says this, the following two propositions hold good and are equally true. Only he who believes is obedient and only he who is obedient believes. I obey because I believe and I believe because I obey. They're they're completely interconnected. You cannot separate the two. True Christian obedience is really confirmed or it's betrayed by my motive by my motive for why I'm doing things. My new motive is to do good works in response to the belief that God has already forgiven me and he's already approved of me. The work I do is an act of obedience and is performed in faith. And here's another paradox. The work I do isn't really even my idea. Look at Ephesians chapter two, verse 10. He says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is a setup. He already did it. He already established the work for me to do. All I'm doing is I'm coming alongside the work that he has prepared for me to do. I will grow in our faith. You will grow in your faith because he prepared the work for us to do, and we're just coming alongside him to do it. In our text, Galatians chapter three, verse five, it's important to focus on for a few minutes. And it really goes to the heart of God performing miracles and God answering prayer. Galatians chapter three, verse five, in our text this morning. Does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Does God do miracles because I'm a good boy? Does my behavior, does my effort, does my work cause God to do miracles? The answer is no. The answer is no. God does miracles as God determines for his good pleasure and for his glory. That's why God does miracles. Many people in this room, even my own family, could use a miracle. Today, you could use a miracle, but it's not going to happen because I'm a good boy. It's not going to happen because we're good boys and girls. You will not read one time in scripture that a miracle is performed because Jesus is so impressed by someone's behavior. You will not read in scripture one time about Jesus doing a miracle because he's so impressed by, uh, by the way someone has acted. Now you will see miracles performed because of someone's faith and you will see miracles performed when it brings God glory. That's the way most of the Miracles end, miracles performed, and God is given glory. 
but you'll never once see a time where a miracle is performed and we are given glory. Not once. It's never based on our behavior. God does not answer prayer based on our behavior. I've gotten this wrong a lot. I, uh, I'll get this wrong again. Let me tell you how this goes. Here's how it goes. I make these deals with God. And uh, sometimes, sometimes he knows about the deal. Sometimes I don't bother telling him about the deal. But here's the deal. I really need this thing to go well, whatever it is. I really need this meeting to go well. I really need this thing to go well with my family. So I'm going to be a really good Christian this week. Uh-huh. I hear you. I'm going to be a really good Christian this week. I'm not going to do these five things, or I'm going to do these five things. And by Friday, man, God will have no choice but to bless me. That I will be such a good Christian that he will have to be good to me. Well, that's an interesting one side of the coin. I'll be good and God will be good to me. Well, there's two sides of every coin. The other side of the coin is a little darker. The other side of the coin is that God is only good if he blesses me. God is only good if he blesses me. God is only good if I get the job. God is only good if the PET scan is clear. And here's what I'm really saying. I will only follow God if he blesses me. This life is a vapor. I don't have God's wisdom. I don't have God's understanding. I don't have his perspective. And I shouldn't put any more conditions on God. He loves us the maximum amount possible. He's He's saved us and paid the ultimate price for us for eternity. Anything else he chooses to do for us is bonus. It is done at his good pleasure. So do I believe God or do I believe me? Do I believe God no matter what? There's a story in Daniel chapter 3 that's helpful to us. Do I believe God no matter what? It's a story about these three faithful men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The nation of Israel, the people of God, have been taken into captivity in Babylon, and they're they're serving under the oppression of King Nebuchadnezzar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have refused to worship Nebuchadnezzar. They've refused to worship the golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar goes to them and says, if you do not worship me, I will cast you into a furnace, literally burn them alive in a furnace. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their response really does inform us. They say, King Nebuchadnezzar, the God of Israel is capable of saving us. The God of Israel is good, and the God of Israel is capable of saving us. But even if he doesn't, but even if he doesn't, we'll still worship him. Because he's worthy. And King Nebuchadnezzar, you're not worthy. We can frame that question over our experiences of God. We need to be okay if God chooses not to answer our prayer. We need to be okay if God chooses not to work the miracle. And more importantly, God is still a good God if he chooses not to answer my prayer. I have so often gotten God's blessings mistaken with what I think God's blessings are supposed to be. God is still worthy of our worship. He's still worthy of giving our life in service to him. So Paul then, in our text, Paul then challenges the Galatians to rethink this in light of one of their heroes. He goes to Abraham. He conjures the ghost of Abraham. And he says, okay, if it's faith plus, if it's Jesus plus, if it's all of this plus, then what about Abraham? What if we apply that to Abraham? Quick reminder, for those of you who are here this summer, we met a guy named Abram. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, his name was Abram. In Hebrew, it's pronounced Abram, and it means exalted father. Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, God says, I will make you, Abram, a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. He will make him a great nation, singular, that's Israel. Then in Genesis 17, by the time we get to Genesis 17, he gets some name change. Abram becomes Abraham. Abram becomes Abraham. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations, 
plural. Abraham means father of a multitude. See, what God has in mind is not only the Hebrews would be among the nations, but also the Gentiles. And there would be a descendant of Abraham, and you can trace the genealogy down through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through King David, and you end up at Jesus, and Jesus would be the one who ultimately would bless the nations with Abraham. In our text, Galatians 3, verse 6 says, and just as Abraham believed God and it was counted him as righteousness, Abraham believed God before he did anything. Abraham was righteous before he did any works of the law. So Paul confronted the Galatians with the truth that they would be very familiar with. Abraham, they had very high opinion of. They, they had respect and admiration for Abraham. And now he says the righteousness of Abraham did not depend on the works of the law. It was only the faith of Abraham. Back in our text, Galatians 3, 9. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. All of the promises of God, all of the promises of God are given to us because of our faith in Christ. All of them. We are adopted into the family of God and we receive a full inheritance as sons and daughters. Okay, so what? So what? Two things. This passage is really about two things. Who we believe, who we believe, and why we do what we do. Who we believe, in whom I place my faith, and why, what's the motive for doing good works. Some of you here today may still be searching for truth. You may still be searching for your faith. And I just want you to know that this is where you begin. Do you believe God? Do you believe God, or is it possible you just believe in God? You can believe in God, and he could be like a Santa Claus in the sky that gives you things. Or he could be the God of the Hebrew Bible who provided a way for you to be saved through his son Jesus. And you believe in him, and you believe in who he says he said he was. That's different than believing in a God of your own understanding. It's different. So I would ask you today, do you believe God? Do you believe God? That's where it all starts. And I also want to encourage you with something, that God gave mankind this sense of exploration and discovery. We are the only beings in the created order that looks out there to find out where we came from. I have never seen a dog looking through a telescope. We're the only ones that do that. We want to know where we came from, and God has given us this sense of curiosity and this sense of discovery. He wants us to find him. So if you're searching, man, keep searching. Don't give up. Keep searching. Believers, believer. now you're sitting there saying, okay, great. You said there's a myth. You said there's a lie that Christians begin by faith, but then we are perfected by our own efforts. If that's the lie, then what's the truth? Here's the truth. Christians begin by faith. We continue by faith, and we're perfected by faith. That's the truth. So this is for believers. Let's get really practical here for a moment. What can we do today? What can I walk out of here today? There's three things. One is believe that the primary will of God in your life is that you will become like Jesus. That's job one. That is the primary call on your life as a Christian. If you're wondering what God's will for you is, if you're not sure, that's the primary will for his life, that you would become like Jesus. Two, believe that we begun by faith and believe that we continue by faith, not by works. Number three, very practically, by faith, lean in, abide, dwell. In faith, apply the gospel to every area of your life. Pastor Kevin DeYoung has a really good question that we can ask of any decision that we're making. Kevin DeYoung asks this, he says, will this help me be more like Jesus? Whatever it is, whatever it is, will this help me be more like Jesus? What job should I take? Take the job that helps you be more like Jesus. What car should I drive? Drive the car that should help you be more like Jesus. What college or university should I go to? You should go to the college or university that helps you be more like Jesus. What person should I date? The person who helps you be more like Jesus. Let's get really personal here for a minute. Will golf help me be more like Jesus? 
Well, golf, like many other things, bowling, pickleball, axe throwing, I don't know what your thing is, whatever your thing is, it's not inherently good or bad. It's not inherently good or evil. So you're not trying to choose between a good thing and a bad thing. You're trying to choose possibly between good, two good things. So maybe you reframe the question a little bit. Maybe it's who you golf with. Maybe it's how often you golf. Maybe, maybe it's who you play pickleball with, how often you play tennis, whatever it is. You reframe the question. You say, can this, whatever it is, help me be more like Jesus? Bottom line, bottom line. What about you asking this question? Is this helping me be more like Jesus? So what about you? So what about you? Paul says the goal is being perfected in our faith. If we pursue life, if we pursue life with this goal of becoming like Jesus, then it really does help clean up our motives. It really does. When we do this, the good works that we do come from a place of faith and a motive of faith. We believe God and we want to become like Jesus and put our faith in him. So for you, believe God will finish the good work that he's begun in you. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for this message this morning. Thank you for this reminder for many of us, God, that it's not about what I do, but God, it's about who you are. God, help me, help us to put our faith in you and not in ourselves. And Lord, help me to work and do work out of an appreciation for what you've already done for me, not to earn not to gain anything from you, God, but just as a thank you. Lord, help me to work in gratitude in response to that. Lord, we just, we just thank you that you call us all here, your sons and daughters. Lord, we're your beloved sons, we're your beloved daughters, and help us walk in that truth today. As we walk out of this building, know that you are a beloved son of the king, you're a beloved daughter of the king, and you can walk in that truth. Lord, help us to walk worthy in that truth today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.